It's really my honor and pleasure tonight to introduce our distinguished speaker, my friend J.D. Flynn. Uh, Mr. Flynn is a graduate of Franciscan University of Steubenville. He was a double major in philosophy and theology, wanting to really leverage his earning power. <laughs> and then what everyone who spends four years in Steubenville does, he decided to stay there longer and get his master's degree in theology. After that, he went to Washington, D.C. and did a canon law degree and got his license in canon law from the Catholic University of America. After graduating from CUA, he moved to Denver to work for the Archdiocese of Denver. He rose to the position of chancellor, which sounds much more impressive than it is. J.D. told me that under canon law, the chancellor's only official role is to be the archivist of the diocese. So. Um, it's good to know canon lawyers and get there to find out the truth. In 2013, Denver's former auxiliary bishop, James Conley, uh, uh, was now the bishop of Lincoln, Nebraska, invited J.D. to become the director of communications and special assistant uh, to the bishop in Lincoln, and that's the position he currently holds. J.D. is married to Kate, and he and Kate have two children, Maximilian Col Colbe and uh, Pia Therese. Um, Tonight he'll be giving a talk entitled, The Truth is Always Pastoral, Canon Law and the New Evangelization, which is certainly a timely topic between the Extraordinary Synod and the Ordinary Synod and the increasing calls we hear to divide uh, pastoral practice from doctrine. So please welcome me and, and uh, welcome J.D. Flynn. Thank you very much for having me. It's 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 uh, it's really nice to be here. Actually, um, I um, have been listening to NPR for a long time, uh, even though I don't agree with a lot of what they say. And so, for as long as I can remember, I've been hearing like really dulcet voices telling me about the Herman Miller Aaron chair, and that that's you guys. That when I when I found that out, um, I was really. Uh, really impressed. Also, Gerald Ford is from here, if you didn't know that. That was something that, I, <laughs> something that I learned today that I thought was really neat about Grand Rapids. So you have a nice town here, insofar as you have Gerald Ford and the Herman Miller Aaron chair. Um, and, and, I, and I really, I do want to thank you for having me. Um, Connor, I want to thank you for inviting me. I, I want to thank the Catholic Lawyers Guild for inviting me and the Authenticum Group, Catechetical Foundations, um, for inviting me to, to speak with you here this evening. Uh, somebody said that uh, you have a lot of new faces, and I'm just wondering how true that is. If you've never been to an Authenticum lecture, would you just give me a sense of that by raising your hand? So that's, that's really neat. I, yeah, thank you for coming. This, this lecture series, so that you know, is, is really something that's, that's pretty impressive. I checked out the website, and the Authenticum lecture series has had some really incredible speakers. You've had Duncan Stroik speak with you, you've had David Whalen, you've had Steve Ayers, you've had Dennis Marshall. Um, the, this, if you haven't been to this series before, I hope you come back because they, they just have a history of having really, really incredible speakers and, and I don't want you to think that you know, the talk that I'm going to give is a reflection on what they ordinarily have, which is something that's really, really quality. So I, I mean, I, and I was telling, I was telling a, a friend of mine about this series and how impressive it is and how esteemed these lectures are and, and, and he asked me, okay, well, that's really neat, why did they invite you? And I, I think... <laughs> I think the reason is because some of those guys probably don't want to come to, to Michigan in um, you know, five degree weather. They want to wait until it's going to be nice. Um, but when I got in my car this morning in Nebraska, it was one degree and I wanted to get somewhere warmer and I did. So for me, <laughs> this is awesome. I'm really, really grateful for that. Um, also, I work cheap and I heard that there would be wine and cheese and crackers, and so I came, so here I am. Um, but but I, I really do want to thank you very much for having me. I, I'm very grateful, and, and um, uh, when Connor extended the invitation for me to come, he asked me to talk about this idea of canon law and the new evangelization, and I think the reason for that, as Connor mentioned, is there's a lot of interest right now in, in the, the, the law of the church, the disciplinary norms of the church, the, the structure of the church, and how that relates to, to our mission, our common mission as evangelists. As, uh, missionary disciples of Jesus Christ, as Pope Francis says, and uh, and and it is it is an interesting topic, and it's one that I think there's a a, a fair amount of confusion about today. That I hope maybe I can um, 
I'll probably contribute to the confusion, but I'd like to add even just a little bit of clarity if I can. Um, uh, I, tonight what I'd like to do is I'd like to just do three things. First of all, I'd like to just talk a little bit about the meaning of this term, the new evangelization. What is the new evangelization? What is it and why does it matter? Then I'd like to talk for a couple of minutes about um, the ways that canon law and my discipline um, help to guide and direct the mission of the new evangelization. In other words, what can the new evangelization learn from canon law and what can it extrapolate from canon law as a sort of um, directional uh, outlay. Um, and then I'd like to talk a little bit about the relationship between mercy and truth in the pastoral ministry of the, of the church. So I want to talk about the new evangelization. I want to talk about what canon law can sort of teach the new evangelization. Then I want to talk about mercy and truth. Um, and and I, I really, I want to do those three things because I, I want to offer some reflections that I hope can help to make us here tonight become better evangelists. Um, evangelization is our, is our common and most important mission. Pope Francis has said something over and over that I've really been struck by. He says the church, uh, and it's not, it's, it's, the, the idea is older than his, but I've heard him say it half a dozen times. He says the church does not have a mission, the church is a mission. And that's true. The church is a mission, and that mission is the salvation of souls. And um, when we talk about the church it being that mission of the salvation of the souls, we're not just talking uh, about the, the institutional church, the hierarchical constitution of the church. We have our bishop here tonight, and I think that's very kind of you to come, Excellency. But when we say the church is a mission, we're not just saying the bishop is, is, is missioned. We're not just saying the priests who are here are missioned. All of us um, are, are members of the church, are part of the body of Christ, and so all of us are responsible for the mission of the church, the formation uh, of missionary disciples and the salvation of souls. And so I'd like to say some things tonight that can help us to um, perhaps become better missionary disciples of Jesus ourself, um, perhaps um, make disciples, help to make disciples of all nations, and, and to rebuild Christian culture, um, one, one heart at a time, one mind at a time, one soul at a time. Rebuilding Christian culture is exactly what the new evangelization is about. Um, you know, I, um, uh, I was baptized a Catholic as an infant, but I didn't, I didn't grow up practicing Catholicism. I, I was um, raised mostly in a Presbyterian church, and when I was a senior in high school, I, uh, through a neat series of, of graced events, I ended up coming back to the church. And as I came back to the church, I kept hearing about um, you know, this term, the new evangelization, the new evangelization, and then I went to, um, uh, to college at the Franciscan University of Steubenville, which is more or less new evangelization U. Um, uh, and, uh, and, and so I kept hearing this term, new evangelization, but I found that when you ask people about it, a lot of times they don't, they don't quite know what it means. It's a term that's become really ubiquitous in our language, but it's not something that we can, many of us, precisely define. Um, I, I, as Connor mentioned, and I've mentioned, I, I have a degree in canon law, and I do some canon law work, and I consult from time to time with, with organizations. And I, I consult with, I've consulted with some apostolates that, that say that they're dedicated to the new evangelization. So FOCUS, the Fellowship of, Uni uh, the Fellowship of Catholic University Students, is a, a group that I've consulted with. And DAO, Educating on the Nature and Dignity of Women, is a group that I've consulted for. The Augustine Institute, which is a, a lay-run graduate school that says its mission is the new evangelization. Um, uh, and, 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 uh, several other organizations that, that really say that their mission is the new evangelization. And I'm telling you that for two reasons. And the first is I want you to know like how awesome my CV is and how impressive I am that I've worked for those guys. But, but more than that, um, I, I'm telling you that because wh when I've talked with people in those organizations whose mission is the new evangelization, I find very often I ask them, so what is the new evangelization? And the answer I get most commonly is, well, it's something maybe with computers. And um, <laughs> You know, there's this sense that the new evangelization, you know, one of the things that John Paul said often about the new evangelization is that we need to undertake evangelization with new ardor and new methods, new ardor, new enthusiasm. Um, he said in Denver, you know, famously at World Youth Day in 1993, be not, do not be afraid to go out into the streets with the gospel. Um, and, and so in some ways we think about this idea of new ardor, new enthusiasm, new methods, new ways to reach people as a part of the new evangelization. Um, and in a certain way that's true, but if you think about that for a minute, it doesn't really hold up, right? Um, has there ever been a time when we've sort of been called to proclaim the gospel with NWE? I mean, are, has there ever been a time when we've been called to use the least effective methods possible to bring souls to Jesus Christ? At times in my own life, I feel like that's what I do, but I don't think it's what I'm supposed to be doing, right? Um, I, 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 we often hear about new methods, new enthusiasm, new ardor for the gospel as being tied up with the new evangelization, and it is. But the new evangelization has to be more than that, or what we would be saying is that the ardor and enthusiasm and methodology of times past has not uh, sufficiently proclaimed the gospel, and I, I just don't think that's true. There's something more to the new evangelization than our methodology. Um, I, I mentioned this idea with the computers. I was talking to a, 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 a great priest friend of mine. He's, he's no longer my spiritual director because I don't see him very often, but um, he was my spiritual director for a long time. Uh, a, a great guy. He's retired now. He's like, I think he's 87, and, and uh, 
and I, I, I told him that I've been doing some talks about the new evangelization lately here and in other places, and he said to me, he said, yeah, you know, I'm really interested in the new evangelization, but I, I, I don't have the internet, so I don't think I can do it. And so, <laughs> fair enough. Um, um, but no, it's not, it's not, you know, there is this ambiguity about it, and I, I think it's more than new ardor and new methods, and John Paul thought that it was more than that too. So I thought it would be useful to just take a minute to talk about how John Paul understood um, the new evangelization, um, because it was he who really uh, brought that term into common usage, and when we think about the new evangelization, we most commonly think about John Paul. Um, Last year in Mexico City at a gathering of bishops, my friend and a, a mentor in my life, Archbishop Charles Chaput, said that, quote, we need to grasp that the new evangelization is finally very much like the old evangelization. We need to understand the, harp, the hopes and fears of today's world, and especially its young adults. And we need to master the new technologies and methods to reach people as they are today. But, he said, and this is important, programs and techniques don't convert the human heart. Only the witness of other people can do that. The new evangelization is, in fact, very much like the old evangelization. It's the witness, the joyful witness, the spoken witness, the proclaimed witness of our lives. Uh, as disciples of Jesus, and, uh, Jesus Christ, joyfully living the Christian life in our joys and in our sufferings, um, in a way that leads people to encounter Christ, to see Christ moving in our own lives and to be attracted to that, um, to hear Christ proclaimed on our lips and to be attracted to that, to be zealous for the gospel, to seek the heroism of the ordinary Christian life. But John Paul II meant all that, but he also suggested the, the term new evangelization with a very particular concept in mind. So let's, let's get to that, because I've been kind of stalling here. Um, here's, let me just go back in history a little bit. Let me give you a little bit of history. So it's 1979, and I'm um, three years from coming into this blessed world, but there we are. Um, <laughs> The newly elected Pope John Paul II, the first Polish Pope, and the former Archbishop of Krakow, makes a historic visit to Soviet-controlled Poland. Um, he, he, he goes to Poland, and uh, George Weigel has said that his visit to Poland were the nine days that changed the world. And he said that because in a nine-day visit to Poland, John Paul witnessed to the vibrancy and endurance of the Catholic faith in a place where radical, status secularism was trying to eradicate it. John Paul, it wasn't just the witness of John Paul that began to transform Poland and began to transform the Soviet Union. It was the witness of the millions of people who came out of their homes to, to, to celebrate Mass on a field outside of Krakow uh, with the Holy Father, to pray the Rosary with the Holy Father, to walk with the Holy Father to Vadovice. Um, the vibrancy of those nine days was the vibrancy of John Paul's witness and the witness of the Catholics who were preserving the faith in their hearts, even in a place which was trying aggressively to undermine the life of faith in their families. John Paul's visit... Was, it, was, was an effort on his part, a very intentional effort. I mean, you, you know, the Holy Father, John Paul II, understood the power of symbol tremendously. He knew the power of his own witness, but he also knew the power of other witnesses. And he knew that if he could go to Poland and proclaim the gospel and witness to the fact that there were still believers living the Christian life joyfully in Poland, he could begin to undermine the sort of radical statist um, uh, atheism that was, that was the ethos of the day in the Soviet bloc. Um, and that was really his intention. He wanted to um, reanimate the, the, the Eastern Europe and Asia with, with the spirit of the gospel. Now, Christianity had come to Poland in 966, so more than 1,000 years before John Paul II went back there in 1979, and more than 1,003 years before I came to this blessed world. Um, <laughs> Christianity came to, to Poland in 1966 with the baptism of Mieszko I, the father of the Polish state. Mieszko I was baptized at just about the same time that he really began to found the thing which we could now call the nation of Poland, even before that, the, the, the Polish people. And so from the very beginning, to be a Pole has in some way meant um, to, be, to be a Christian, and, and specifically to be a Catholic. And, and, and you could see that, I mean, if you know anything about the history of Poland, which I didn't until recently, but I've been learning about it. Um, the Polish people have produced saints and missionaries and holy families and holy vocations in the context of an authentically Christian culture, which became, as sort of statism developed, an authentically Christian nation. Um, but the establishment of Poland as a satellite state of the Soviet Union at the conclusion of the Second World War inaugurated an era of secular, materialist, and communist indoctrination on the part of party organizers and state officials. This was the context, the context in which um, a, 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 a new dehumanizing system of communism was trying to repress something which was essential to the identity of the Polish people, in which John Paul II came uh, to Poland um, speaking in the ruins of a once proudly Christian country. That was the context in which he proclaimed for the first time that, quote, a new evangelization has begun. 
as if it were a proclamation, even if in reality, as if it were a new proclamation, even if it is in reality the same as ever. It was in the context of a, a, of a, a, a piously, devoutly, and beautifully Christian place that had begun to lose the sense of its own Christian identity, and, and in that way had begun to lose the sense of its own identity entirely, that John Paul II said as he witnessed to the, to the endurance of the Christian life, a new evangelization has begun. When John Paul referred to the new evangelization, he was expressing a commitment to the re-Christianization of this nation with deep ecclesial roots. John Paul wasn't talking when he said a new evangelization had begun about what we call ad gentes missionary activity. He wasn't talking about going somewhere where people have never heard the gospel and translating the Bible into their language and proclaiming the gospel. That, that's an important thing, but it wasn't what he was talking about. And he wasn't talking about catechesis either. He wasn't saying these are people who have the faith, but they need to learn more about it. He was saying these are people who have been baptized, who co who, who, whose very identity in some ways is consistent with Christianity and tied up with Christianity, but who have never encountered the person of Jesus Christ. That's what the new evangelization was. Um, George Weigel called it a cultural aggiornamento for a people, quote, once formed by a church that had become ever more irrelevant in their own lives, end quote. In Poland, John Paul was talking about proclaiming Christ to his own brothers and sisters, to those men and women who had already received, in most parts, the grace of baptism. He clarified this idea as time went on in Redemptor's Missio, which was issued in 1990. I was around by then, don't worry. John Paul called, quote, the new evangelization of Christian peoples to be the church's universal mission. Redemptor's Missio said that with, the, 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 said, clarified with precision the subjects to the new evangelization, who the new evangelization was going after. John Paul says, um, he's talking about various situations of missionary activity, and he says there's an, an inter intermediate situation, particularly in countries with ancient Christian roots and occasionally in the younger churches as well, churches like ours in the United States, where entire groups of the baptized have lost a living sense of the faith, or even no longer consider themselves to be members of the church and live a life far removed from Christ and his gospel. In this case, what is needed is, quote, a new evangelization or a re-evangelization. Let me read that again. There are occasionally situations where entire groups of the baptized have lost a living sense of the faith, or even no longer consider themselves to be members of the church and live a life far removed from Christ and his gospel. In this case, what is needed is a new evangelization or a re-evangelization. Entire groups of the people having lost a living sense of the faith or no longer considering themselves members of the church. Does that sound familiar to anybody? Does that sort of sound like the kind of thing that you encounter um, in, in your workplace and on the soccer field and um, probably in your families? It does to me. When I hear about entire groups of the, uh, of the faithful, who, of the baptized who have lost a living sense of the faith, I think about, um, I think about Christmas, you know, at my grandma's with my aunts and uncles and my cousins who uh, have been baptized, but um, for whom, as John Paul says, um, um, they have lived a life far removed from Christ and his gospel. Now, that's not their fault, and I think that's what John Paul is saying, is that um, the, the, the mission of the new evangelization is to witness to Christ in such a way that it's compelling and attractive and beautiful to people who are already our own brothers and sisters in Christ, to, our, to our, our, our fellow Christians and most especially our fellow Catholics. The new evangelization is the mission of witnessing and preaching Christ anew to Christians, to the baptized themselves. Perhaps, you know, in some cases, those who have been catechized and rejected the faith. How many know someone who had been catechized, went to Catholic school their whole life, went to Catholic college, et cetera, et cetera, and then rejected the faith? Yeah, one guy. I don't believe that. <laughs> After I said one guy, father in the back raised his hand because he didn't want this guy to be alone. The two guys, but I don't, I don't think that's true either. Most of us, I think, know someone who has been catechized and rejected the faith. And then he says, or perhaps those who have been baptized and never heard the gospel or responded to it. How many of us know someone who's been baptized and never heard the gospel and responded to it? That's the mission of the new evangelization. And, and in order to understand the scope of the mission of the new evangelization, I think we need to face an important reality about the state of Western culture, and it's this. We are living, dear brothers and sisters, in a post-Christian Western culture. There are vestiges of Christianity in our culture, to be sure. Um, the, the, the culture of many of our families is a, perhaps a Christian culture, and thanks be to God for that. The culture of things like this, the cultural experience of the Authenticum Lecture is a, is, is, is a, is, is a, a witness to Christian culture. I think by and large, if you take even five minutes to reflect on the kind of world that we live in, on what you see when you turn on the television, on what the conversation is when you go to work. Well, I work at church, so not me. But what you turn the, on what the conversation is when, when you go to work, uh, you'll hear that what John Paul is saying is true. We're living uh, largely in a post-Christian culture. 
Many people we know who have been baptized have never subjectively encountered Jesus Christ in a way that was meaningful and compelling and, and, and transformative for them. Um, many people we know who have been baptized have never seen the truth and goodness and beauty of the faith. Uh, many people we know have been, never been given a sense of what it means to live the Christian life joyfully. That's the mission of the new evangelization. And the missionaries of the new evangelization are us because we, we, we're the ones who know people in these situations. The mission of the new evangelization belongs to us, not just because that's a nice thing to say, but because we're the ones who have the, the ability, we're the ones who have the relationships that allow us to witness to Christ, that allow us to witness to um, the beauty of grace and mercy, that allow us to witness to the meaning of the sacramental life, that allow us to witness to the truth and goodness and beauty that Christ and his church um, proclaim and witness to. The, the mission of the new evangelization is ours because the subjects of the new evangelization are our brothers and sisters, and I don't mean that figuratively. I mean, in many cases, certainly in my own, the subjects of the new evangelization are our brothers and sisters. So we, we do have a, a mission, and, we, and the mission is the new evangelization, and the new evangelization is not something with computers. Um, certainly it requires ardor and enthusiasm, but the thing to understand about the mission of the new evangelization is that it is the joyful, faithful, active witness of life in Jesus Christ to the people who we know um, who have been baptized, who have experienced some touch of grace, and who have never encountered Christ apart from that in a way that compels them to live the Christian life. So I'm a canon lawyer. What is canon law, and how does, how does canon law help with that? Um, I think there are two things that, that canon law can, can help with, and I, I know there are a lot of people here who are lawyers, so I'll try and get as kind of legalistic about this as I can, if, that would make, if you guys would like. Um, but I, I think there are two things that canon law can do that can sort of help us in this project of the new evangelization. Uh, two things that canon law can teach us um, uh, about the new evangelization. The, the first is this. Um, the first is that uh, canon law can help us to understand who, who that means. Who, uh, if, if the new evangelization is the proclamation of the gospel to Catholics, the witness of the gospel to Catholics, the first thing that canon law can do is really give us a very clear sense of, of who is a Catholic. And that sounds like a really silly thing, but I find a lot that when I ask people who is a Catholic, I get kind of really interesting answers. Um, a Catholic is a person who goes to Mass. Uh, a Catholic is a person who can profess the creed in good conscience. Um, a Catholic is a person who subscribes to a, a particular set of beliefs that the Church subscribes to. Um, a, a Catholic is someone who goes to Mass more than just on Christmas and Easter. A Catholic is someone who goes, who, if they only go to church on Christmas and Easter, at least they don't take my seat in the pew because that's rude. Those people only come once a year and they take my seat. Um, right? Uh, it, really, if you ask yourself, who is a Catholic? Who's the subject of the new evangelization? Um, but sometimes we don't have clarity on that. And it's an important question, and I'm going to tell you why it's an important question in a minute, because maybe it just sounds like quibbling, and perhaps it is. But um, canon law, it's canon law who teaches us, uh, that teaches us who is a Catholic, and, and it grounds it in something that I think is really important. Here's what canon 96 of the Code of Canon Law. You know what I should have done is I should have read the canon and then asked the bishop what canon it was, because uh, he's a canon lawyer. I think he would have gotten this one right. Um, but, you know, maybe I'll do that if I come to a canon later. <laughs> or, or maybe I won't because uh, I want to get invited back here. <laughs> Gerald Ford is from Grand Rapids. Did you guys know that? <laughs> so here's what, um, here's, what, here's what Canon 96 of the Code of Canon Law says about who is a Catholic. When it's asked this question, who is a Catholic, it, starts, it doesn't start with a Catholic is. It starts with this, by baptism. One is incorporated into the Church of Christ and is constituted a person in it with the duties and rights which are proper to Christians in keeping with their condition insofar as they're inclusive. By baptism, one is incorporated into the Church of Christ and is constituted a person in it. A Catholic, in one way or another, is a person who has been baptized and therefore been incorporated into the Church of Christ, which subsists in the Catholic Church. Um, does every single Catholic, does every single Christian uh, have a, a perfect relationship of communion with the Church? No, but um, a, a, I don't, there are some sort of questions about ecumenism that we could get in here that I don't want to because I want to make this point. Um, a member of the church is a person who has been baptized. Uh, a member of the church is not a person who has um, filled out their parish registration. We moved two years ago and I haven't filled out my parish registration yet because I told my pastor, well, we're members of the church because we live here. And he said, no, you have to fill out this form. And so we're playing this little game now, except I think he forgot about it and I haven't. So I don't know what to do. <laughs> So anyway, neither here nor there. You should fill out the paper. But you're not, a pa you're not a Catholic. You're not a member of the church because you filled out the paper. You're not a member of the church um, because you profess or don't profess the creed. You're not a member of the church because you have faith or not. You're not a member of the church because you believe or not. You're a member of the church by virtue of one thing, and it's this, baptism. And that matters because canon, when Canon 96 says, by baptism, a person is a, is a, is a, 
incorporated into the Church of Christ and constitute a person in it. What that means is that when we are incorporated into the church, um, it's something that we can't undo in, in any way by ourselves, by our own actions. You, you can't undo your baptism um, uh, in, in any way. You can't, you can't make yourself not baptized. When you're baptized, you're configured to Christ. You're, you're remitted from the penalties of original sin, and you um, are, are configured with the character of faith, hope, and love. It, it, someone could say that even better than I could. But when you're baptized, you're configured in a certain way. You're changed. And the way that you're changed is you're drawn into um, the, the person of Jesus Christ, the church of Jesus Christ, to become a member of, Jesus Christ, uh, of the body of Christ, not only in this life, but um, in an eternal perspective. You become a member of the body of Christ. Um, and the body of Christ is manifested on earth in our church. Um, and so the Catholics are Catholics by virtue of baptism. Now, why does that matter? Why am I sort of harping on this? Um, because baptism gives us something that um, really nothing else gives us. Bishop, do you want to play the canon game, or you want me to just say what it is? This is a tough one, so I'll just say. <laughs> canon 849 says <laughs> that, by that the baptized are reborn as children of God and configured to Christ by an indelible character, and therefore incorporated into the church. Being a member of the church is coterminous with the idea of being configured to Christ, and given the capacity by being configured to Christ um, to love as God loves. Uh, to, to, to share in the inner life of the Trinity. Now, by virtue of being baptized, it doesn't mean that whatever we do for the rest of our lives, um, we will love as God loves. It doesn't mean that we'll share eternal life with God. We can be baptized, be a part of the body of Christ, and still lose our eternal salvation. But by virtue of being baptized, we can share in the inner life of, uh, of the Trinity. And by virtue of being baptized, we can escape the universal call to holiness. Baptism has the power to incorporate us into the family of God in a way that no choice of ours can totally repudiate it. And if we're serious about the new evangelization, the first thing we have to do is start with the idea that every single person who's baptized is called to holiness. And every single person who's baptized is our brother and sister. And the reason I make this point is because very often, um, it, it's very easy for us to... Um, uh, to, to congregate with those um, who already think like we do. It's very easy for us to congregate with uh, those who already believe like we do. It's very easy for us to think about the church um, as those people uh, uh, who, who go to Mass with us and who sort of like to talk about, you know, kind of churchy stuff after Mass and who are generally sort of polite and well scrubbed. It's very easy for us to think about the church in that way. Um, but if we do that, we're cutting off a great number of our brothers and sisters and we're undermining the fact that they're called to holiness and we're called to help them with that holiness. So the first sort of sense that we need to have of the new evangelization is it's our obligation to our brothers and sisters who are called to holiness in the same way that we are. Um, and that the church, the church needs those people. The, the, you know, the, the body suffers without its members. Um, the, body, the body of Christ would suffer without us, and the body of Christ suffers without those um, who, who are not you know, in, in incorporated into the life of the church in a full and concrete and active way. And so the call of the new evangelization is a call to people who can't undo the fact that they're baptized, who can't undo the fact that they're our brothers and sisters in Christ, who can't undo the fact that they're united to us, and who are called to holiness. And we need to begin with the idea that because we are baptized, because anyone is baptized, um, we have the profound capacity to become holy. This is the starting point for the new evangelization. We need to share the very good news that baptism confers the capacity to love as God loves. When we talk to the baptized who aren't in, 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 sharing the life of the church in a regular way, we can share the good news that their baptism, this gift that they already have, makes us their brothers and sisters, that we perceive that we're responsible for them, and that they have the grace to meet the challenges of their lives. Baptism is a grace, and the grace of baptism gives us the capacity to love perfectly as God the Father loves perfectly. So um, it isn't enough for us, I think, when we engage in the work of the new evangelization to say that someone ought to turn away from sin. Because the fact of the matter is a person who's baptized has more than just ought to turn away from sin. The good news of the new evangelization is that the baptized have in some way the freedom to turn away from sin. Already possess in their baptism the capacity for faith, hope, and charity. Sharing the good news about what it means to be a baptized believer is a compelling witness to the new evangelization. Sharing with people that they are incorporated into our body and that that matters to us is a compelling invitation to share in the life of Christ. Sharing with other people that they have been set free by their baptism um, is a compelling witness to the meaning of the Christian life and to the meaning of redemption. I think we ought to start with that. Um, the truth is that everyone wants to love well, everyone wants to love, and everyone wants to be loved. We're made to love, we're made to love, we're made to be loved, and so we want that. Uh, I don't know any person who doesn't want to be loved, and I don't know any person who doesn't want to give love either. 
Blessed John Don Scotus says that heaven is the experience of eternal beatitude, the experience of loving and being loved eternally, because that's the nature of the Trinity, and our baptism is a foretaste of that. That means that the central message of, message of the new evangelization is this, to, to each person who is not participating in the life of Christ, to each person who is living, as John Paul says, as if the gospel were irrelevant to them, the first message is this, you are a member of our family, the family of God. You're a member of this people, the people of God. You can be set free from every sin that binds you because you in your baptism have the capacity to love as God loves. So I, I mentioned that I didn't um, grow up practicing Catholicism. I was, um, I, I was baptized as an infant and then I grew up mostly in a Presbyterian church and I had this conversion my senior year of high school. And then re really shortly after I, after I started practicing Catholicism, I went to, to college. I, I mentioned that I went to Franciscan University of Steubenville. If, if, you don't, if you aren't familiar with the Franciscan University of Steubenville, um, it's a place with a lot of kids who are Catholic. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's, it's a school with um, a, a, a life uh, alive in Jesus Christ. And I went there for that reason, a life alive in the church, and I went there for that reason. And so at a, at a school like this, it wasn't unusual that on the first day, we had the orientation, and the kids were walking around, and we were getting the tours, and then uh, everybody in the group sat down and spontaneously decided to pray a rosary, um, which I thought was neat, but also sort of weird to do on the first day of college, because I... My own, the, everything I knew about college I learned from the movie Animal House, so I didn't think that <laughs> we'd be saying the rosary right on the very first day. But, you know, this is what happened. I went to the college, I, we had the orientation, we walked around, and then these kids sat down and they said, well, let's say the rosary, and, and, um, and I had never said the rosary, I didn't know what it was, but I had one. My grandma had given it to me. My grandma said, and she'd given me a rosary, and it was in this little plastic case. It was a really, really nice rosary that I lost. Um, but, but I had it then, <laughs> and so they were going to pray the rosary, and I, I was so excited I got mine out, you know, and, um, and so the guy, the guy who was sort of the leader of the group asked me, do, do you want to lead the rosary? And I, you know, I suffer with being shy a lot in my life, but in this particular moment I wasn't shy. I thought, yeah, I'll, I'll lead the rosary, that sounds great. Um, and I knew kind of, I, you know, it has these beads, you know, and, um, and I knew that you prayed, it had something to do with the beads, you know, so I, and I knew that Catholics prayed, started prayers with the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. So I did that part right. <laughs> um, I prayed in the name of the Father, Son and the Holy Spirit, and then I got to the first bead, and so I kind of held on to it, which is what I thought you should do, and I said a prayer that we would have a really good, good semester. And, um, <laughs> like, then I went to the next bead, and I said a prayer that the students who hadn't arrived yet would, would arrive safely. And then I went to the next bead, and I prayed for my mom. But the fourth bead, the fourth beat, I thought, oh, okay, this is going pretty well. Let's <laughs> take a risk here. So on the fourth beat, um, I prayed specifically for this really attractive girl who was in the group, that she would have a good semester <laughs> and that maybe we could hang out sometime, you know? Um, so, I mean, I, and I thought I was doing it right. Um, and they, they let me go for a whole decade. <laughs> Which, and then the, the leader guy kind of puts his hand on my shoulder and he goes, that was great, man. I'll take it from here, bro. And then, <laughs> and then they said the rosary. And I, 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 for a while, I thought maybe every rosary started with ten sort of spontaneous prayers and then saying the rosary, but I, I figured it out after doing that a couple times. But w what the guy said when he, when he put his hand on my shoulder and took it over, he goes, he goes, that's okay, man. You'll get it. And then he says to me, you're already a son of Mary, whether you know it or not. And I felt like, wow. I don't know that. I don't know what that means at all. But I led the rosary. That was pretty sweet. Um, he, but he looked, I mean, he looked me right in the eye and he said, you're already a son of Mary, whether you know it or not. That's the message of the new evangelization. Whether you know it or not, if you're baptized, you're already a member of this family. Mary is already your mother and she's praying for you. Jesus Christ is already your brother who went to the cross for you and um, drew you into his life in baptism and forgave you um, sin and gave you the capacity to, for faith, hope, and charity in your baptism. Um, it's not that these things can happen for you. It's that the Holy Spirit is already in a certain way indwelling in your life. That's the message of the new evangelization to the baptized. You are already a part of this family and that has meaning. Not only meaning in this life, um, but meaning in the next life. Because it gives you the capacity to, to live a life that's extraordinary. A life in holiness that's absolutely extraordinary and transformative. So what's the sort of second thing that canon law can give to us um, uh, in, with regard to the new evangelization is this. Um, my second point on canon law is that canon law gives us a sense of what the universal call to holiness actually looks like. Um, we hear this term, universal call to holiness, not as often as new evangelization, but we hear this term, universal call to holiness, and, and it sounds great, um, but it's, it's, it's good to know sort of what, what are the confines for that? What are, what, what are the contours for that? Well, the, the code of canon law gives us sort of a starting off point 
for the universal call to holiness. And by that I mean it gives us a sense of sort of where Catholics should start, what the basis is um, for living a life that's alive and free in the life of the church in which the Holy Spirit is moving. And it calls that basis point um, the obligation to maintain full communion with the church. The Code of Canon Law says that Catholics are obliged to maintain full communion with the church. And I think that's sort of a precise way of describing the new evangelization as an invitation to Catholics, um, whether, they're you know, whether they're living a life uh, in accord with the faith or not, whether they have ever heard that they're a son of Mary and a brother of Jesus or not, whether they've ever confessed their sins or not, I think the, a good way to sort of precisely see the new evangelization is an invitation of Catholics to share in the full communion of the Catholic Church. The full communion of the church is a communion of three things, faith, governance, and sacraments. If you believe what the church says is true um, and profess that, you are in communion with us insofar as matters of faith. Now, if, you, if you honestly can look at your life and say, yes, you know, I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, etc., etc., um, you probably shouldn't say it just like that, but if you can honestly look at your life and say, yes, I believe these things what the Catholic Church says is, are true, um, then you are in communion with us insofar as faith. Um, governance. If you can honestly say, yes, um, I believe that the bishop um, is, is ordained as a successor as the apostles and in some way exercises pastoral and fatherly leadership over my life to which I should submit myself. To which I should submit myself. And yes, I believe that my pastor um, is, is placed in a position of leadership in my life to which I should submit myself. If, if you can say honestly, yes, I believe that Christ has instituted a church with leadership figures um, who exercise authority in my Christian life, um, then you're in communion with us insofar as the matter of governance. And sacraments means that you can participate in the sacramental life. If you can honestly and freely avail yourself of the sacraments, if you um, can honestly and freely avail yourself of the sacrament of penance and the sacrament of Eucharist and um, the, the sacraments of the church, then you are in communion with us insofar as the sacramental life. But if you can't profess what we believe to be true, um, if, if what the church professes to be true um, does not strike you as being true and you therefore say, well, that isn't true, well, then um, you've, you're not in full communion with us. If you don't believe that Christ instituted a church and that you have some obligation to submit yourself to the authority of that church, that you can um, take the gospel and run with it in any way that you think is appropriate, well, then you're not in full communion with us insofar as governments. And if um, there's something in your life that's keeping you from participating in the sacramental life of the church, if there's some impediment in your life to being able to freely receive um, the, the Eucharist, to being able to freely confess your sins and be forgiven from them, uh, well then you're not in full communion with us insofar as the sacramental life of the church goes. And so um, the, the, these things, these sort of checks that canon law gives us, faith, governance, and sacraments, these are sort of a jumping off point for what it means to be in communion with the church and what it means to move in, in the Catholic sense towards a, towards, towards a life of holiness. John Paul says that full communion with the church um, uh, is the place in which we can, the Holy Spirit can create an environment for sanctity in the church. That those who are in full communion in the church, the Holy Spirit can move in them to create an environment for sanctity. Um, but it is, this isn't easy. I mean, it isn't easy in any of our lives to maintain full communion with the church at, at any given time. Um, that, that's why the vocation to the full communion of the church is, is a vocation to uh, a Christian life which requires extraordinary grace and extraordinary virtue. Um, because every single Christian is made for greatness. No matter how it's manifested, um, every single Catholic, by virtue of, 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 of having this grace of baptism, is called to something that's extraordinary, that's heroic. Um, and we can express that in, as a life of the fullest kind of communion uh, with the church, uh, the, the fullest participation in the life of the church. In the apostolic letter, Novo Millennio Innuente, John Paul II remarked that the time has come to repropose wholeheartedly to everyone a high standard of ordinary Christian living, to repropose to the whole life of the Christian com community and of families um, everything that the church does must lead in this direction. He says, quote, I have no hesitation in saying that all pastoral initiatives must be set in relation to holiness. Then he says, a pastoral plan for holiness quote, implies the conviction that since baptism is a true entry into the holiness of God through incorporation into Christ in the church, it would be a contradiction for a Christian to settle for a life of mediocrity marked by a minimalist ethic and a shallow religiosity. It would be a contradiction for a Christian to settle. That's the lesson of the call to full communion. Another way to say it is this, heroism, um, the opposite of mediocrity, greatness of soul, magnanimity, greatness, um, is precisely the vocation of the average Christian. There's nothing average about the vocation of the average Christian. Pope Benedict put it this way very famously. 
the world offers you comfort, but you Catholics were not made for comfort, you were made for greatness. The process of sanctification is the process of being configured to the incarnate word of Jesus, to Jesus Christ himself. We are saved in order to share in the perfection of the most blessed trinity. The church calls this theosis. The process of theosis, theosis is of sanctifying transformation, of being configured so that our wills are configured entirely to the will of God. And it's in this process, which is a grace that we can't possibly merit, we can't possibly achieve on ourselves, but it's in this process that we achieve the most intimate communion with Jesus Christ and with his church. It's in this process of sanctification, of becoming holy, that we enter into the fullest kind of communion with the church and with Jesus Christ. Most of us, I think, will only be made imperfect and only be in the, the, the fullest kind of communion with Jesus Christ and his church in the process of purgation after our deaths. Um, but that doesn't mitigate the fact that our vocation is to aspire to holiness, to pursue holiness. That our vocation, as John Paul says, um, uh, is to recognize that baptism is a true entry into the holiness of God and to recognize, quote, that it would be a contradiction to settle for a life of mediocrity. The end and purpose of the Christian life is to love the Lord our God with all our heart and soul and mind and to love our neighbors as ourselves. That's what it means to love as God loves, to love the Lord our God with all our heart and soul and mind and to love our neighbors as ourselves. We cannot settle for anything else, brothers and sisters in Christ, because that's the vocation of the fullest kind of communion with Christ and his church. The Second Vatican Council calls our role in our own salvation, quote, the dignity of ca causality. And because we have dignity, Christ calls us to participate in, our, in the process of our own sanctification, to choose in a daily way um, the, the things which will make us holy and the set of the things that will draw us further away from Christ. It would be a mistake, it would, uh, unless I'm being unclear, which I may be, I think it would be a mistake to reduce what I'm saying to a kind of pharisaical Pelagianism. What I'm not saying is that we need to earn our own salvation. Um, and I'm not saying that sort of observing the law, canon law or otherwise, in itself is the criteria by which we'll be judged in, in, in all eternity, that we've kept the law um, only in the sense of, you know, sort of the external formalities of exactly what the church says. Instead, I'm saying that the law is what John Paul called the pastoral, quote, the pastoral plan that orients us to holiness. What the church asks of us in our daily lives, that the church asks us in this season of Lent to abstain from meat on Fridays if we're under... Um, the age of that, I can't remember what it is, but 60, right? So 64, to abstain from me if we're under 64, which I am, um, and to fast on Good Friday and Ash Wednesday. Um, that we observe those things, um, that what the church calls us to is what John calls it, Paul calls, quote, the pastoral plan that orients us to holiness. If we're in full communion of the church, if we can profess the faith of the church, if we submit ourselves to the governance of the church, if we share in the sacramental life of the church, there is what John Paul says, quote, space for the Holy Spirit to indwell in our lives. But I don't think the common mistake today is the mistake of Pelagianism, the idea of, of having to earn our own salvation. I think perhaps at one time it was. I think perhaps at one time there was a sense that, you know, um, the Christian life, and, and there was, it was called the heresy of Pelagianism, and it was a long time ago, but the sense that the Christian life, you know, achieving sanctity was something we just sort of had to do on our own. I think the common mistake today um, is the reduction of the meaning of religious experience reduction of the potential for extraordinary holiness in a disordered sense of the end of religion, religion the telos of religion, so to speak. Um, I, I think the mistake today is, is the idea that um, the faith, the church, uh, our religious faith, um, is something which um, can help us in a jam. It's something that can make us feel better when we're down. Uh, it's what Roger Ray and others have called moral therapeutic deism. The idea that God is out there um, and he wants us to generally be nice to each other um, and if we're sad or if we have a problem, we can pray to him and he will be there for us. I, I think that's the prevailing attitude about, uh, about religiosity today. And I, it's not only that I think that, it's that um, a, a bunch of sociologists from Notre Dame did a study of people who are under 35 and they asked them a lot of questions about God and the conclusion is that nearly everyone in America who's under 35 is a moral therapeutic deist. We think generally we need to be nice to each other. We think generally we need to be fair. We think generally we need to be kind. Um, we think that God is sort of out there and that he'll be there for us in a pinch or if we have trouble or if we're sad about something. And that's what we think the meaning of religiosity is. Um, that's what we think the meaning of our religious faith is according, at least to these sociologists, not, not me, but um, that's, that's what the majority of people in America under 35 think uh, uh, religi religion is, moral therapeutic deism, some basic principles and a God who will be there for you when you're sad. But what that is really is a reduction 
of the reality of the Christian life, which is that God just doesn't sort of want to be out there and then um, be there for us when he's sad. God doesn't want um, the, the, the sole purpose of the church to be to sort of comfort us in moments of difficulty or to pass us from you know, one life phase into another. Um, that the purpose of, of the church, the purpose of the Christian life, um, is our total union, the total union of our will with God's and this experience of eternal beatitude, um, this ex experience of, of eternally sharing in the inner life of the Trinity. That's a lot more meaningful, it's a lot more compelling, and it's also a lot more difficult. Because if, if we're moral therapeutic deists, as the sociologists at Notre Dame say most people under 35 are, if we're moral therapeutic deists, then our religion really doesn't demand very much of us at all. And we don't really have to demand very much of it either. We want to, um, you know, be able to uh, kind of know some prayers to say when we're sad and maybe from time to time at certain moments in our life we want to write a passage and we want to sort of um, have um, some idea of what it means to be nice to each other, but that's about it. But that's a reduction of intimate, uh, eternal, everlasting communion with God that comes from our ability to be perfected as God is perfect. But I think, um, you know, there's, there's confusion about this uh, that, that comes from, from all over the place. Um, uh, and what the confusion does is it favors the subjective experience of religion over its purpose. Uh, when I talk to people I know who don't practice um, any religion, or when I talk to people I know who don't practice Catholicism, and, and I ask them, why don't you go to any church, or why do you go to this church instead of coming to Mass, which is where I'd like you to come, they tell me that they went to Mass a couple times and they didn't feel fed. Um, or they tell me that um, they really like uh, the music at um, the big warehousey church on the other side of town, or they tell you know, and that's why they don't go to mass, uh, or they tell me that they can find God in nature. Often, the people who tell me that they can find God in nature are like on the couch playing their PlayStation when they tell me that, and they wouldn't know where nature was if if you pointed at it for them. But um, they have this idea that somewhere out there is a thing called nature, and somewhere in that thing called nature is a thing called God. Um, but we, we favor the subjective experience of, re of religion over its purpose. We want to find something that satisfies um, our sort of sensible appetites for, uh, not only for kind of a good musical experience, which is an okay sensible appetite, that's why we have beautiful liturgy, um, not only something that satisfies kind of what we want in the moment, um, but also something that makes us feel good about ourselves. We favor the validation of religion over its purpose. Um, we favor uh, the validation of our moral choices over um, the pronouncement of moral choices that require us to change in our lives. And I think this favoring of the subjective experience of, of religion over its purpose is something that we need to be aware of. And one way to combat it um, is to point out to people that they're made for more than that. They're made for greatness and a great life, a great souled life, a life of radical relationship with Jesus Christ is more joyful than moralistic therapeutic deism can ever be because moralistic therapeutic deism is ultimately empty. There's no relationship there with anybody. I think I'm running out of time, but I have a whole other page. Um, so I'll just talk for a couple more minutes. I'll summarize this page. Um, one of the things that I was asked to talk about is, is where sort of mercy fits into this schema. I think the reason for that is because there's a lot of conversation about kind of mercy and its relationship to the new evangelization, mercy and its relationship to justice. Um, if you, if you like me, uh, if like me you're a Pope Francis fan, I'm a big Pope Francis fan, and one of the things I really like about the Holy Father is um, uh, his, his Episcopal motto, which is now his pontifical motto, miserando et aliquando. It comes from uh, a homily from St. Bede, an English monk, about the conversion of St. Matthew. And the phrase comes from this little section, Christ, seeing St. Matthew with the eyes of mercy, called him. Christ, seeing St. Matthew with the eyes of mercy, called him. Christ sees each one of us with the eyes of mercy and he calls us. What does this mean? What does mercy mean? What does it have to do with what Christ calls us to? We already know that Christ called Matthew to a life of extraordinary holiness and that Christ calls each of us to a life of extraordinary holiness. What do the eyes of mercy have to do with that? If, if I can, I'd like to share just a brief story. It's my favorite kind of story because it's about me. And um, it takes place uh, at a time when I was uh, hardly worthy to be called a Catholic, a grave sinner, mired in pride and sinfulness and selfishness. Uh, it takes place last week. Um, well, last week was kind of a tough week for my family. I uh, had um, to work a lot. I had a, a bunch of early mornings and then a bunch of late nights. So I was like working from early in the morning to late at night. And, um, and our kids both had the stomach flu. And so um, my wife like uh, had no help and she had these two like cranky kids with the stomach flu and they were getting sick all over the place and I hear that it was really gross but I don't know because I was at work. Um, 
And, uh, and so it's just a rough week, especially a rough week for my wife. And, and it's been cold, obviously. And so the kids couldn't go outside and, and, and she didn't really get a break, et cetera, et cetera. We've had some other stuff going on. So it's just, just a long week. And, and uh, my wife is, is practically a saint. I mean, she's genuinely the best person that I know. Um, but we handle stress differently. Um, my wife is also the most German person that I know. Um, she likes things to be ordered and precise. She likes to have a plan and know what the plan is. And um, she likes to know that I'll do my parts of the plan. Well, I'm one of the most sort of sentimentally Irish people that I know, which is that like I hear about a plan and I sort of internalize it while I'm thinking about something else. And then I feel intensely guilty that I didn't do my part of the plan <laughs> and probably cry about it a little bit. And then we do the cycle again. Uh, well, you know, that, most of the time that works for us OK. Um, um, but last week was a tough week, and, and, and um, although my wife is practically a saint, I left some things that I was supposed to do undone, and she got mad about it. So we had a little fight. So we had a little, we had a little fight, and then um, it was my Saturday to go to confession anyway, so I went to confession, and, <laughs> and so I'm in there, and, I, and I'm, I'm telling my confessor about the fight. And I'm telling him about all the things that my wife had done that led up to the fight. That if she hadn't done, we maybe we wouldn't have had the fight. And then I'm telling him about all the things in the fight that she said that she should not have said, you guys. And I'm telling him about all the, the things that she did. And, and the kids were sleeping and how loud she was and how inconsiderate that was, not only of me, but of them. Um, <laughs> And, you know, it's, I'm in there five, ten minutes, and I'm sure there's like a super, super nice little, kind of little lady waiting in line praying the rosary for me. But I'm just going on about these problems with my wife. And my confessor, Father Felix, a Spaniard, interrupts me and he says, JD, I don't care, man. I said, what? He said, I really don't care about Kate's sins, man. He said, she can come to confession for her sins. He said, those are her problems. Then he said something really profound. He said, it doesn't matter what she does. He says, it doesn't matter how you feel about it. He says, it doesn't matter whether it's justified or not. He said, your vocation is to love. Well, Father Felix told me the truth. He did exactly what a confessor is supposed to do. He cut through my excuses. He cut through my blame casting. He cut through my focus on others. And he told me the truth. It was incredible. It was profound. It was powerful. And it, was, it, and it meant something to me. I thought about it for, for like a whole minute. I sat there without saying anything, which is <laughs> probably the longest time I've ever sat somewhere without saying anything in my entire life. I couldn't even look him in the eye. I was just thinking about how right Father Felix was and how I always make excuses for my own behavior and how I always blame other people, especially my family, and how I always think that the problem is that someone else did something instead of me doing something. I just Father Felix was absolutely right, and that means that I have to change my behavior, not only in my marriage, but in a bunch of other relationships too. So I did what any honest person would do at that point. I responded the best way I knew how. I looked up, I looked him right in the eyes, and I took a deep breath. Father. That is the absolute worst advice I have ever heard in my entire life. You have no idea what you're talking about. It's clear that you have no idea what this situation is. Well, again, he said he didn't care, and I should confess my sins, and I did confess my sins, and he was off me, and I went home. Um, but he was right. What was Father doing? Um, he was looking at me through eyes of mercy because he saw my sinfulness, but he also saw my potential for more. He saw that because I'm baptized, um, I have the capacity to love even at a time when I feel frustrated. He saw that because I'm baptized, I have the capacity to choose virtue even if someone else is choosing something wrong, which in retrospect, I don't think my wife is doing anything wrong, but it's hard to admit that and I'm not going to tell her. Um, <laughs> but uh, he saw, he looked at me with eyes of mercy and he not only saw my sinfulness, he saw my potential. That's what Christ saw when he looked at St. Matthew, the tax collector, and he looked at him through eyes of mercy and he called him. He saw that he was a sinner and he called him to extraordinary holiness. That's what it means to look at someone through our eyes of mercy and to, and to call him. There's a reason that we pray, oh, happy fault that merited for us the incarnation of Christ thy son. Because God's response to the fall of man in the Garden of Eden far surpasses his original relationship with us. Through Christ, through the incarnation of Christ, our relationship to God is far more than what we have a right for it to be. We don't have a right from anything from God. We're, we're creatures, right? We exist because God wills us to exist. But through Christ, we become sons and daughters of God the Father. But through Christ, we become brothers and sisters with the second person of the Trinity, brothers and sisters with our Redeemer. And, and even this is, is kind of analogous and imperfect to express the profundity of the relationship between God and us through Christ. We're creatures, but through Christ, we share in God's own life. That's what mercy means. It means that we can be gifted more than what is just for us to have. 
pastoral care that's merciful points the way to that reality. We say the truth is pastoral, which is the title I was given for this talk, because pastoral care, pastoral truth, pastoral evangelization leads people to the fullness of this idea of mercy. Compared with the prospect of being made uh, configured to the will of God to have an intimate relationship with Him, um, being comfortable um, is hardly worth anything at all. And, and a preference for the comfortable over the true um, hardly cares about us at all. So there's a tension, as Connor said, between mercy and justice. It's this. Mercy exceeds justice. God has the right to rule over us. We don't have the right to an eternal and supernatural life with Him. We don't have the right to share in the dynamic and life-giving love of, love of the Blessed Trinity. Mercy is the gift by which we can share in God's own life. And that's manifested. Mercy is manifested in our life by the grace to choose the pursuit of holiness, to aspire to the vocation of holiness, to aspire to the greatness of the Christian life. St. Thomas Aquinas says that mercy is, quote, perfection given to things through God expelling defects. Mercy is perfection given to things, creatures, by God expelling defects. We experience mercy transformatively when we recognize our defects and we ask God to expel them from our lives. Mercy is God reaching into our lives and seeing our sinfulness and expelling it from us. If we don't want to, to see our defects, if, we're not, if we can't see our sinfulness, if we call our sinfulness good, um, we deny God the chance to be merciful by expelling those defects from our lives. Um, we can't imagine that it's mercy to call something that isn't, un, that isn't true, true. We, we can't imagine that it's mercy um, to pretend that the intimate life of God comes through anything other than the pastoral plan for holiness that God outlines in our lives. So I, I, uh, where does that leave us? I, I think it leaves us with this. Um, the trajectory of the new evangelization is to recognize that the baptized are our brothers and sisters in Christ, to recognize that the baptized by virtue of, of their baptism are called, um, looked at through eyes of mercy, called to an extraordinary life with Jesus Christ and given the grace to live that extraordinary life. Um, if we want to make disciples of, all, of, of, of Catholics, we need to begin by recognizing the power and meaning of baptism. We need to begin by recognizing the power and meaning of our own baptism, that God has called us for something extraordinary and we need to open ourselves to the will of God to find out what that extraordinary thing is and to follow after it. We need to recognize the power and meaning of the baptism of others, that they're made our brothers and sisters in Christ and we have a responsibility for them and that they too are made for something incredible and something great. We need to recognize the pastoral plan for holiness that John Paul says the extraordinary life of the average Christian. We need to recognize the centrality of mercy, mercy the thing which makes this intimate relationship with Christ possible through our sanctification, um, through, through the holiness that God puts into our life by expelling our defects. Um, mercy is a critical part of the new evangelization. Mercy helps us to live in full communion, helps us to live the potential of our baptism. Um, holiness, the potential of our baptism, is sharing in the inner life of God. I think there's a temptation today sometimes to think that mercy um, mitigates the expectations of the inner life of God, that, that mercy uh, you know, is, is to see where someone is and, and, and not to call them to something greater, that mercy is not to call someone out of, uh, out of sinfulness, not to call someone out of a relationship that needs to change, that mercy is to comfort someone, uh, to be there with them, uh, instead of to have the kind of relationship with them that knows what God has called them to um, and to invite them to that. Um, but mercy makes possible greatness in every single life, especially the life of the baptized. Mercy makes it possible for each of us to be conformed to the life of the Trinity. And finally, that's the only thing that really matters. Thanks very much. Uh, can you address this issue that you uh, started to touch on at the very end uh, concerning mercy and justice and how uh, seeing with the eyes of mercy does not, in a sense, uh, eliminate the demand of justice, but does something in a, uh, above and beyond that? Because isn't, isn't that the great danger that uh, be merciful. Oh, let's let's not worry about yeah, it. Yeah, I think there is a tremendous danger of sort of being reductive about about 
the Christian life as a consequence of what we think of as being merciful. I think um, Dives and Misericordiae is a, the second encyclical of John Paul II, and it's about mercy, and it's just fantastic. So um, you, you should read that because it's going to be better than what I'm going to say here. But um, one of the things that he says in that is that mercy is a superabundance of justice, that mercy um, takes what is just and gives a double portion of it. Um, so if what is, ju you know, so, so I think kind of contemporarily we have the idea that mercy is, um, you know, show mercy, to show mercy on someone is to absolve them of their responsibilities, to tell them that they don't, uh, you know, that they don't have the responsibility that they once had. But what John Paul says in Dives and Misericordia is that mercy is the gift of giving someone not only the ability to meet their responsibilities, not only the ability to meet what is just, um, but the ability uh, to go beyond that, to have something more than that. And I think that's really central to our Catholic um, soteriology, our Catholic sen sense of salvation. So as Catholics, what do we believe that it means to be, um, to be saved, to have eternal life? Um, we don't think that it means that um, Christ went to the cross and he merited salvation and um, we're sinners and will always be sinners, but sort of Christ's sacrifice covers over our sinfulness and that's the end of it. Instead, we think that Christ went to the cross um, and, and died and was resurrected um, and uh, redeemed death and resurrection um, in such a way that um, through his grace, through baptism into his life, um, we can not just sort of be covered over with Christ's perfection, but we can share in it. You know, we can be freed from our sinfulness instead of just having it kind of covered over. I think that's what mercy is. It's being um, freed from the thing by meeting it. We, there's a consequence to our sinfulness. You know, the consequence to our sinfulness is a rupture with God. Um, mercy is not just sort of saying, well, we'll forget about that. Don't worry about it. That's not true. Um, what's true is saying there's a bridge past this rupture with God. And not only that, not only can you be restored to the original state of man prior to the fall of man, but you can have something more intimate with that. Because through Christ, through baptism, we don't just have what Adam and Eve have. We have something 10 million times better than what Adam and Eve had. Um, it's something far more meaningful in our relationship um, w with the Trinity. Uh, we know that because the Eucharist is present to us. Um, that Adam and Eve couldn't eat, um, and, and we take and eat the body of Christ, and so we know that we have something far more profound. So the, the danger, I think, always is this idea that mercy just absolves us of our responsibility. Uh, that, that to be merciful is to tell someone um, they can't do it, they won't do it, it's too hard, and they don't have to. But real mercy, God's mercy, is to say it is hard, and I'm going to give you the grace and the ability and the tools to do it, and I'm going to be right there with you for it, and there's going to be consequences. Does that make sense? Yeah. We got time for one more. There's, some, there's a guy in the back and a guy right here. And another guy who's pointing at the guy in the back. That's awesome. <laughs> That's fantastic. I guess my question is about the new evangelization. So as it sounds like part of the theme that I hear running through there is there's a lot of lukewarmness out there and, and you talk about you know our, our our family you know it's also people who are baptized but also our literal family how have you found ways that are effective to kind of I guess shake people out of that lukewarmness have you have you seen any great successes or demonstrations of this new evangelization the question is how do you how do you reach people who are uh, who are not you know fully actively living a life of faith who are baptized um, one of the things that for me, I, I mean, has just been effective in, in people who are my friends and people who are my relatives who, are, who um, uh, you know, have, have returned to a fuller life of the church um, is, is the power, the transformative power of beauty. Um, Benedict XVI, borrowing from Hansers von Balthasar, says that um, uh, modern man is, is in some ways, um, the relativism is so profound in our culture that we're in some ways incapable of um, perceiving immediately what is true and what is um, good, but um, he says, John Benedict says in a beautiful phrase, beauty is the arrow that wounds. Uh, so I, I have a, did you, yeah, there's a great little book called Wounded by the Arrow of Beauty. That's a series of essays by Benedict XVI on beauty. You should get it. Um, or have him come here and give a lecture about it. <laughs> awesome. Um, but, um, but I mean, I, 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 I know people, I can name people who um, have come back to the church as a consequence of um, of beautiful liturgy, of inviting them to beautiful liturgy, and that mo moving something in their own life that they uh, that they wouldn't have otherwise seen. And, and I'll answer one other answer, and I think it's this: I think um, the uh, authentic witness of the Christian life is an incredibly compelling thing in people's lives. And here, here's what I mean by that: um, if we think that we're going to be really effective evangelists by just sort of going out and um, telling everybody how much we love Jesus um, and how they should love Jesus too, we probably won't. 
Um, but where, where I think we're most effective is where we share our lives uh, really and truly with other people in a way that witnesses to how God is working in our lives. And I, I'm going to tell a, a story about my wife, um, a, a good story about my wife, because I want to redeem the other thing. Um, so our daughter, I, I, I have a daughter, and uh, Pia, and Pia's two. And um, when Pia was born, we adopted her. We adopted her on the day that she was born, and she came with us home with us like two days after she was born. And so she had her five day checkup. You know, five days after she was born, and um, and at her five day checkup, they they did some blood draws, which is typical. I don't know if it's typical for every five day checkup, but it's typical for kids with Down syndrome. So they did some blood draws, and uh, Kate and the baby came home. And then um, like an hour later, the nurse called my cell phone. At the, the pediatrician's office called my cell phone, and the nurse said, "You you you and your wife need to come into the pediatrician's office." And I never go to the pediatrician's office because I'm a dad, and you know, um, moms usually do the hard stuff. And so I said, so, but I said to the nurse, I said, "Wow, that sounds really, really ominous. You know, that sounds scary." And she said, "Yeah, you need to go to the pediatrician's office right now." So we went to the pediatrician's office, and and uh, our daughter was with us, and we knew that something was really wrong because when we walked in, the receptionist kind of came out from behind the desk and gave my wife this big hug, and we looked at each other and just thought, "Oh crap." Um, so it was kind of um, our daughter had had a kind of leukemia, and so she they told us that she needed to be admitted to the hospital right away. So we took her to the hospital. And she was admitted to the hospital, and that night um, she had two heart attacks, and um, and uh, her life was saved by the doctors. But if if her life had you know if she hadn't gone to the hospital, if we hadn't gone to the checkup, we would have lost her. Well, she she she's had leukemia twice, and um, uh, in her in her little life she had she went to remission after three months the first time, and then after nine months the second time. And my wife um, has borne that with in absolutely incredible grace. It's been. Um, incredibly difficult for, for for both of us, but especially it's been incredibly difficult for my for my wife, who's been there in the hospital with my daughter all this time, and and um, and it's been a test of faith for her. It's been I mean she's just been tired. It's a hard thing. Um, my wife knows five five women who have come back to the church because she shared with them um, how she was suffering and what God was doing in that suffering, how she was suffering and that it had meaning, um, how she was suffering, how she was struggling, how she doubted. And how God responded to that. Uh, what I love about my wife is she's profoundly honest. Like when I don't do the things I'm supposed to, she's. Prof but what I love about my wife is she's profoundly honest. And, and in, in this, this cross that she's been given, this cross that we've been, my wife has been incredibly and profoundly honest about about doubt, about fear, um, about you know just uh, difficulty and tiredness and uncomfort. And she knows five women who who have come back to the church because Kate said, you know. Um, I didn't think I could carry this, and I and I fell asleep saying, saying the rosary, and I knew that the Lord was with me, and that was enough for me. Or um, there was a time when we didn't know if we, our daughter was going to make it, and my wife told a friend, you know, I don't know if our daughter, if Pia's going to make it, but if Pia doesn't make it, I, I, I know that she'll be in heaven, and I know that her suffering will be worthwhile. Well, that, that lady, that friend, told Kate that she, she stayed up for like two hours just bawling about that. Um, well, I'm not telling a story about how awesome my wife is, just to tell a story about how awesome my wife is, although that's a good thing to do. Uh, I'm telling the story because I think that one of the ways that we can be really effective evangelists is just to be um, really authentic about, about the difficulties that we all face in the Christian life, the difficulties of faith that we all face. I love in, in Introduction to Christianity, which is a great book by Benedict XVI, you should get him here to talk about it. Um, uh, I love this section that he has about doubt. He says, um, if anybody's read this book, you know what I'm talking about because it's just haunting. He says, um, uh, um, he, he describes, th this is, he was Cardinal Ratzinger at the time when he wrote this book, but this is Cardinal Ratzinger, you know, the man who's going to become Benedict XVI. He describes waking up in the middle of the night afraid that maybe God isn't real. Um, and then he talks about the atheist who wakes up in the middle of the night afraid that God is real. Um, and he says that doubt is this profoundly human experience, but he's honest about it. He says he doubts in the celebration of the liturgy sometimes whether the liturgy is efficacious. He's honest about that. And then he says something that I think is <laughs> like so beautiful and profound, but also a little bit sad. He says, there is no escape from the dilemma of being a man. Um, and I think he means mankind. So there's no escape from the dilemma of being a person, to be more clear. What he means is we all face the same kind of doubts. We all face the same kind of fears. We all face the same kind of challenges. And if we're honest about that, and then if we're honest about what Christ is doing in those doubts, how the Holy Spirit is moving in our lives, um, people see the witness of meaning um, in a place where they're searching for meaning and grasping, and, and, and grasping for it and pulling at it. And they see the enduring witness of faith um, in a place where they're searching themselves to answer the most profound and deep and difficult and painful questions in their lives. But I think it's authenticity. M more than anything else, you, it's, it's the authenticity of our own lives. That's, that's something that I've seen for sure. So anyway. Let's give Mr.